Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? I can, Marek. How are you? Yeah, all right. Thank you. Great to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, I'm recording this just, just to confirm it with you so that I can um, share it later. I'm not sure, sure if I told you that I'm preparing for that um, big conference, international conference for, for English teachers, um, where I would like to like you know present the whole teaching learning process for from uh, different points of view. And that's why you are here with me today. Uh, and this is something as I, I also, I've also spoken to some people connected with cognitive science and people who've written books, you know, about stuff like that. So I want to merge it all together and basically help teachers around the world to get to the other side of the thing, you know, put it upside down at times, you know, and, and see what really works. A general question for um, uh, at the beginning. If you look at um, today's education, uh, in particular foreign language learning and teaching, has it changed too much in your opinion over the last hundred years, or at least recently? Can you notice any any changes? So, I mean, for a hundred years, I think that it's difficult to say exactly how things have changed for that period of time. It's, it's a long time. I think also it would depend on a country by country basis, sort of on a country to country basis, the, the way we teach languages is different. So some countries and some institutions and some languages have had a real turnaround as to how they're taught. So the very traditional, you know, you sort of, you go through and you learn the grammatical aspects of the language and you, you go through tables and sort of, you know, all of the verb forms, all of the, um, the, the different declensions uh, for the nouns and things like that, where people would learn in sort of a table form. Uh, you still see that in a number of places around the world. So that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So yeah. there are things that haven't changed for a long time. Yeah. So to pretend that that doesn't exist, I think would be wrong. Yeah. Uh, to pretend also that there aren't places where that's changed drastically would also be wrong. So I think, um, you know, the advent of, of the, for me, I think one of the, the big courses that really shows how this has changed is the Ulpan method. Uh, that's used in Israel to when people make Aliyah to Israel and they go through the Ulpan method to learn to speak Hebrew. It was a, a course developed very much with the intention to get people speaking the language within a year so that they could function in, in, in society in Hebrew. And so you have things like that and then other language courses modeled after that. There was the Ulpan course that was used for Welsh as well, which basically made people learn in a very practical way what they needed to use for day-to-day -day communication. And you see many, many different sort of variations on this with language apps, um, like the one I was just using recently to learn Estonian Speakly, where they take the most common uh, things that you would learn and they build you up slowly but surely to a point where you can converse and understand, you know, up to 80 or more percent of the most common things that you would hear in, in daily conversation. And it sort of moves, that would definitely be as something I would see as moving away from the, today we're gonna to talk about all the possible professions you could ever meet. And then you learn maybe 120 professions, half of which you would never use because they have no relationship to your, your life and your circle of friends or family. But you sort of spend a lot of energy and time focusing on things that you will never ever use, or you may never ever use until a lot later. And if you do need to use it, you can always quickly Google it and, and you've got it, yeah? That's exactly. Thing. Yeah. And I think, so there are definitely in places where that, that happens. There are also places where, uh, with, with languages that are not English. English, I think, traditionally has been taught in a way where the teachers really have to, particularly if you're teaching English as a second language, you have to teach it through English because you don't necessarily have the people available to teach English as a second language through another language, particularly people who are originally from uh, or went through the education system in the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, they basically just speak English or they may speak another language, not necessarily where they're teaching. So there's been a long tradition, I think, of, of those types of people going out and teaching English through English. That's not always been the same for other languages, the other way around, where it has tend to be taught through an intermediary language, whether that's English or another language. And so 
that also I've seen change through the years. And I went through that process with the Yunus Emre Institute, where we were taught Turkish through Turkish. Mm. And there were some grammatical explanations through Macedonian, which is the common language, but generally it was all done through Turkish. And the idea is to get you thinking in the language, right? So this also, when you see people go into these classrooms, they may come from a background of, they're used to seeing all of these grammatical tables and freak out with this, yeah. what's going on? First of all, yeah. you're not speaking a word of my language and I need a translation. And secondly, they may only teach you the bits that you need right now and not explain all of the grammar straight away so that it's not grammatically heavy and so that it's not a theoretical course on the language, but really a practical introduction to the language. So you do see both. So in answer to your question, that's the long version. All right. Yes, yes, we've come a long way and we've changed. And no, we haven't. We've stayed where we were. <laughs> so, we, yeah, I think we can um, to summarize this, I think, because some people say that we go in circles, you know, you know that we keep coming back to the same ideas um, that we used to talk about years ago. But I think it's, it's kind of like a different structure. It's not in circles because we always kind of develop. Yeah, there's a spiraling effect. The spiral, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh-huh. But we, we definitely have changed a lot, but some institutions haven't. I mean, it's yeah. just the way it is, right? So yes and no, I mm -hmm. think is my answer to that question. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Richard, so from this general kind of beginning, I'd like to ask you something um, about you. So when you begin that adventure with a new language, how does it go from you for you from the beginning? How do you go from scratch to so so fluency where you can like you know we don't have to think too much and you just mm. say things how does it all start and how do you feel at the beginning because for me personally when i started a new language uh, recently i felt frustration at the beginning and i was um disappointed with with what i could do initially and then when i like changed the methods and changed the way i learned it suddenly like became more motivating and i was beginning to feel uh, proud of myself. How does it go how does, with you from the beginning? Uh, each language is different. So um, there are, for a few reasons. So every language will have different types of material available to learn. And uh, some of them, will, you know, the choice is really quite limited for some languages, particularly um, indigenous, endangered and minority languages, but also some um, other languages with millions and millions of speakers can also have quite reduced or limited uh, resources available. So a lot will depend on that and how it's taught. Um, and also a lot will depend on the other languages that I may or may not speak that are related to it, uh, the new language. So for example, for me to go and learn a language like, I don't know, Ukrainian, for example, I already have a very strong base in um, Slavic languages. So it wouldn't be a huge leap for me to start communicating, particularly to understand Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many languages like that where if I were to do it, it's not truly from scratch. There's, All a, right. there's, there's a baseline there, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are other languages where I, I don't have that and um, it really just takes time. And it's reminding yourself constantly that there is an awful lot that you need to input into your brain before you can really say much of anything. I mean, mm -hmm. you can sort of get excited with the very first words and phrases that you use, but you very quickly realize where the boundaries are. And it's a lot to do with motivation and endurance and perseverance and just breaking through all of those barriers uh, in, the, in the beginning stages so that you can start saying things that you want to say that are meaningful to you and mm. for me they're the things that really carry me through to the more advanced stages in a language because if i don't go break through those properly and start really communicating communicating things that are truly meaningful then i don't okay. really go anywhere uh, it turns into a, a theoretical sort of overview of the language mm -hmm. which can happen and there's nothing wrong with doing that if that's your goal yeah but if your goal is communication, then of course you need to really memorize uh, the language, the words, the, how you use them in context to the point that it becomes an automatic thing that you do. And it's not something you're particularly considering. It's mm -hmm. just 
just do it. Um, I don't suffer from the barriers of, uh, you know, psychologically of, of um, making mistakes. I don't really care if I make a mistake. I think it's completely natural and normal. And, and if I make mistakes, then I kind of welcome them as learning experiences. Sometimes they're quite funny, so they become memorable. Mm-hmm. And it helps me to remember the language better if I make lots of mistakes. That's the thing. It's like, you know, they, they help you encode some things yeah, to, to like, you know, kind of make them stick yeah, in, in your brain and the mistakes. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, sometimes I find that people shy away from them or they're afraid of um, making mistakes because they don't want to seem stupid or they think they have to do it, say everything and do everything perfectly. Um, sometimes some of the other barriers are pronouncing things incorrectly. Um, again, I find that this comes with time and um, there's no need to feel shy or embarrassed. It's trying to pronounce like somebody who speaks the language normally is not putting on a fake accent. It's not a parody, but you, there is some imitation and mimicry necessary if you want to get as close as you can to the sounds of the language. And I think sometimes people do suffer from that too, that they feel if they move away from their natural accent and pronunciation yeah. and rhythm and pattern of speech, that they feel that all they should really do is uh, insert the new words and grammar over their own sound systems. And actually it's, it can be a bit challenging for a lot of people to sort of get over that and say, actually, no, you know what? I speak a different, in a different way. It's not just a different words, a different grammar, it's a different way. And I don't suffer from that either. I don't really mm-hmm. mind uh, giving sort of a, my best shot at um, just imitating and mimicking people I hear using the language. Mm-hmm. So those are truths that I sort of follow all the time, sort of, you know, making sure I'm motivated, making sure I've got things that keep me motivated, like songs, um, community, finding the right people um, online who use the language or learn the language. Um, also, it could be uh, finding spheres of interest, for example, that maybe I, I particularly like and explore those through the language. So the motivation needs to be covered. And then doing it on a daily basis, having constant access and um, having that language as part of my life is really important because if you just study it once or twice a week, well, you can't really expect the language to come in into your brain through osmosis. That's not how it works. So I I have to do something regularly. Otherwise, um, the other language will never be really in my head. So they're the, they're, the, they're the only two things that are always true for me. And then depends on the resources. So uh, if I find something good, then I'll do it. And I will always try and use the language actively. Let me relate to two things uh, you mentioned there. First of all, I'd like to go back to what we said at the beginning about uh, how the language teaching has changed over like 100 years. So in the past, something very important that you mentioned um, making mistakes. Mm-hmm. Um, students weren't allowed to do that. It was something um, very bad to do in class. They, they, the teachers would get angry and would say, if you say, speak like that, don't say anything. And then it changed drastically as now we all know that we learn from mistakes as that's like, you know, very important in the learning process. And the other thing um, you, you mentioned before, uh, and it's very important for me, for example, the reason why I couldn't start speaking Italian is because what you just said, I was trying to learn unnecessary things. I was trying to memorize lots of things that you don't normally use on a daily basis. And then I went to Italy and a simple situation in a, in a supermarket, I couldn't ask the woman to slice a ham for me. And, and I was like, oh my goodness, what was ham? And how much do I need? How do I say that? And so on. So learning lots of different words, like you said, list of words in the past was the thing. Nowadays, for me, I started speaking very quickly. When I started um, putting information about myself into full sentences, yeah. not learning single words, but saying things like, oh, I've got three sons and, and my wife, she's a teacher and blah, blah. So when I started saying those things, it, it just like you said, it makes a big difference because you start personalizing the whole uh, input, yeah? So my next question is, um, 
kind of like connected with what you've just said uh, and and another another thing, you've given us a very um, wide view on, on everything that you do. Now, d- can you tell us if there is anything in particular that you do at the very beginning? Do you go to classes? Do you self-study all the time? How does it start like from that very first moment when you do it? What, what, what are the things that you do? Mm, good question. I do a mixture of things. So um, kind of as I hinted at, depends on the language and it depends what's available. So I actually quite like uh, a class or study group situation, if I can, if I can have it. And simply because I think learning languages is um, a community thing. I think it's a thing that you do where you, you have a camaraderie that builds up uh, with other people who are either learning or using the language. So I really like that dynamic. So I do join classes to learn languages. And what I try to do also is I try to take the language course as it goes. So I don't like to rush ahead and be that annoying person saying, oh, I know, I know. You know. <laughs> I don't like to be that person in a class. Um, I prefer to say, okay, and accept that for me, the important thing is the, is the community and not my need to rush ahead with all of the learning because it really isn't. And um, sometimes you just need to accept that also it takes time for these words to, and the grammar to sink in anyway. So why not just take it a little bit more slowly and, and get there with the group? So... I've been doing that with a few languages uh, recently and have done it in the past too. So I studied at university. I also did a number of courses um, for a number of languages in the past and, and I really enjoy it. Sometimes though there are no courses and sometimes I actually quite like doing it on my own. And what I tend to do is find a book that really speaks to me uh, where choice is available. And I just start going through it as it's normally as it's prescribed by the author uh, as far as I can. And I, I tend to take, for example, if it's a teach yourself book, I will go through it. Some of the translation exercises I, I, I might skip because I, I find them a little bit dull. I'm not a translation um, enthusiast generally. So depending on, the, on, on what it is, if it's just translating words, I may just do it in my head sort of writing it all out. But otherwise I, will, I would follow most of the things um, uh, and, and just sort of go through the, the dialogues. And then I would usually find a speaker of the language and practice the dialogues with the speaker. And then I would substitute out things that are more relevant to me. So for example, if those people are in Italy and it's sunny, I might be in a different country and it's cloudy or, mm you know, um, things that are more important or more relevant to my life. And then um, if it's about this person's got two sons, well, I have a daughter, so I talk about my daughter and not my, not the two sons that I don't have. Um, so I, I tend to sort of make the dialogues fit my life as well and practice them in that way so that I build up this idea of language that's related to my life that I'm going to repeat again and again and again whenever I come across somebody and, um, and uh, yeah, it's going to be the same story over and over again, right? So you get confident with these lines that are trotted out almost like, like a play. Um, and, and then also I, I start building up the language as I go through the course. And that's really what I do. It's just about going through regularly and, and being consistent. You mentioned uh, another very interesting thing, which is translating things that you're learning. Uh, this is uh, there are very um, there are various opinions on, on that, like you know, from, from uh, different styles of teaching and so on. Many people say that uh, it's best, like you said previously, uh, to learn the foreign language using only foreign, foreign language only during uh, the process of learning. Um, I remember when I uh, started learning English, um, I learned lots of things very quickly. It's, it's much easier to learn English because it, we're surrounded with it, yeah? But there were, there were many things that I, I acquired and they became my own phrases, words, and so on. But after some time, I realized that I started using them incorrectly. 
there was a, there was a problem with accuracy, and I realized that, gosh, I don't know a hundred percent what it means. I I, I don't have that um, confidence in it. Yeah. So, what do you think about? Do you do that, or do you try to avoid it to check what exactly? I'm not saying translating everything. Yeah, but having that feeling where you've got that phrase, you say that sentence, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm not 100% sure what it's correct. And I would actually say that there are monolingual speakers of languages that have that same problem, mm -hmm. that they learn a word and then they don't fully understand what it means. Um, you get this quite quite often. Mm -hmm. um, one word that, all, that in English, for example, is often not fully understood or appreciated amongst English speakers is the word decadent. Mm -hmm. Uh, the way the way the word decadent is used in marketing for example it makes people think very positively about the word decadent mm -hmm. we talk about it as sort of chocolate products and things like this decadent chocolatey you know sort of smooth silky chocolate things mm -hmm. and it, it's almost a positive whereas decadent actually is has negative connotations to it yeah. um, in you know historically um, whereas this is these are the kinds of things that i think um, when you're exposed to more and more of the language, they start to even out. Mm -hmm. And particularly with words that are adjectives, um, you know, words that are more etherical in nature, mm -hmm. that is, you know, I can, I can say to you, okay, this is a phone. And there's not really much more I can say about it. It's a phone. And that's really it. It's a, okay, if you're American cell phone or if, mm -hmm. you know, or a mobile phone. For, yeah. for, for, but otherwise it's a phone. A phone is a phone is a phone. Um, but some words are much, much more difficult to describe. And you have to see them in many different, used in many different ways to fully appreciate what they really mean. And sometimes even a translation of that word doesn't do it justice. So let me give you an example. In English, there's a word abominable. Mm -hmm. Now, if I translate the word abominable into French, it's abominable, mm -hmm. okay? Same word, right, same word. Abominable in French can be used in the true sense of the word abominable in French. If you were to use that word in English, it would sound very silly. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is that intrinsically for English, English speakers who grew up speaking English, the word abominable is linked to a snowman, mm -hmm. the abominable snowman. So it's not a word that you can use in serious literature or in serious writing or in a serious conversation because it will, it will always, there will always be an internal giggle that happens. <laughs> yeah. And that's something that you're never going to find a definition for why it's like that. It just is. Mm -hmm. And it takes time and exposure to the language and how people use it to really get a feel for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so no, I don't tend to use translations. I don't, I don't think, I, don't, I never translate in my head. Um, so in fact, I don't believe that many people do. I think that we think that we think in language, but I don't think we actually do more often than not. I mean, I may be wrong, but um, I think a lot of people think that they think in language, but actually language to think in language in full sentences is actually very slow for the brain. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you have an idea, you, don't all, all, you haven't automatically got an entire section of text in your head for that idea. You have an idea and then you, then you have the text, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you have a reaction to something, you, the word comes after the thoughts. Do you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. this is kind of how my brain works anyway. But I'm very conscious that I don't have the words until they come out. So therefore, translation isn't something that I would naturally do anyway. Mm -hmm. um, However, I'm not one of those people that thinks that you should only do it with the language, like with just in that language. If there's an easy way to explain something through the other language that's, um, you know, that's shared amongst the group or uh, against the teacher and the, and the student, then why not use it as a crutch? I mean, as adults, we have the advantage of having learned a language already. And a word like important is generally speaking, 
a concept that if you want to explain it, it's best to just say, this means important and you learn important. Yeah. Because otherwise you could spend hours going through how, oh, how is it used in this context? And you could waste time in the learning process. Mm-hmm. A simple translation is actually a lot more productive and a lot easier to sort of grasp uh, for the, the learner. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is that, um, you know, against children, for example, who seem to learn very quickly, well, they learn quickly because they're not afraid of making mistakes like adults. But the thing that adults have over children is we can all write normally when we come mm-hmm. to learn another language. So we have the ability to visualize words, particularly if they're in the same script as the one we already speak. So we can always visualize, we can use sounds that we already know. We already know some of these um, words that are not related to a definite object like the phone, um, words like important, essential, things that tend to be very similar from language to language. Mm-hmm. And we automatically have this concept. So I think it's very good to use those. Also, if you're aware of grammatical features that have a direct correlation, why not say, well, this is this? Mm-hmm. Because if you keep people guessing at what it kind of means and you just use the language, it will get, you'll get there in the end, but it will take longer because you have mm-hmm. to expose them to way more language to do it. Whereas you can explain it and then expose them to the language. And I think it becomes a um, much more productive use of time. So to put it into uh, more of a practical advice for language classes, I think we both agree that um, translating everything you do in the foreign language is unnecessary and it just slows down the learning process. However, there are times where it's worth switching to, um, to L1, as we call it, just for a short moment to clarify something and then get back. This, this is what I usually do in classes when I teach. I see it in their eyes. They are not, not really like following. So I always say that 20 seconds when I switch to Polish and quickly clarify it helps a lot instead of confusing them even more. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so sometimes and I think people do crave that. And also it stops them from sort of feeling really lost and sort of talking to each yeah, other. Yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, whilst I think that using the target language is, is generally a really good thing, mm-hmm. and you should use it as much as possible, I'm definitely not against and actually would support that if, if it's possible to use the L1 or whichever other language there is available, mm-hmm. uh, because sometimes there are mixed classes, right, with different people from different places, yeah. with different L1s, um, it can be trickier, but if there is that option, uh, sometimes it can really save time and frustration mm-hmm. for the student. Mm-hmm. Um, an interesting question, uh, something that after talking to many learners, I noticed that some of them do it, some of them don't. I personally found out that I actually do it quite a lot. I mean, talking to yourself in a foreign language when, when you're trying to learn it, not really talking out loud, that happens as well, but most of the time, like saying the things in your head when you are uh, doing something, looking at something familiar to you, something that you do on a daily basis, and you try to make, put it into a sentence, a few sentences, to act sort of like, you know, try to say what it is, what you do, and so on. Yeah, you, uh, I, I, yeah, I would definitely say that I, I do that. So sometimes it will be, like you say, sometimes out loud to practice. Thank you. I'm not mad. <laughs> I'm not crazy. Not, yeah. I, I think it's normal. I mean, sometimes you, you you get people who talk through what they're doing in, in their own language, right? Mm-hmm. So if you can substitute that for what you normally would do uh, in a language to do it in the target language, I think that's quite a helpful thing to do for practice. Um, thinking about sort of what you want to say and what, how you would say it, it, sometimes you can make notes for your next class or to look up later. Okay, I couldn't say that word, I couldn't say this word. It's very easy now, we can do this on the go and we can write them on our phone, right? We can even look them up directly on Google Translate if, we, if mm-hmm. we're, we're desperate and see, and then make a note of it and then check with teachers, okay, am I using this correctly? Or is this in the right case or the right tense or whatever else? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it's a really handy thing to do. Um, and I definitely do that. And I definitely would, if I'm in the country where the language is spoken, I would definitely look at signs as well and make notes of what I'm seeing and then talk about and repeat it and try and read things all the time. Uh, those kinds of active things, I think, really, really help. Mm-hmm. 
What about, um, let's go back to, to grammar, uh, because you mentioned that at the very beginning. Um, what about grammar? Do you, how, what's your approach to it? How, how do you make it um, sink in? How do you make it like, you know, uh, work for you uh, and so that you can finally use it correctly? Do you ever learn the rules? Do you ever go through those tables and stuff? Or do you have your special way? Um, so sometimes, yes. Yeah. Sometimes, I mean, I've, I've been through many different courses um, throughout my life where we've had to learn through tables and that kind of, very, you know, sort of rote memorization uh, that we use. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of doing that all the time. Um, and the reason is, is that I've, I've observed other people learning languages. And if you are to teach somebody a language and you just go through all of the the case endings, like Polish, for example. I mean, if you were to teach somebody with Pochong train, yeah. um, and then you were to treat, teach them all of the way Pochong can end or how it can change, mm -hmm. you'd be there with, what, 14 different variations of this word Pochong. And instead of, actually, where are you most likely to use the word, okay, by train, Pochong. And... and by train or on the train you now have that in one way you can say okay you're you're not likely to use the, that word in many other contexts so why memorize all of these things that will just end up confusing you and you'll be like do i say pochongu now or do i say pochongim or do i say yeah, 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 yeah. Or, or how do i say it and just learn the ones that you really need to for the time being because later you will start seeing the other forms and just be aware that the, the word will change. I, I've been through this just now with Estonian and I still don't know, I've not studied the, the actual, every single grammatical ending for Estonian, but I know that it will change. The words will change, the verbs will change uh, depending on the person, depending on the situation. Some of them now I've, I've, I've got quite clear in my head. Others, no, I haven't, I still don't know um, every single instance of how that word will change and why, mm -hmm. but do I need it to communicate? Not really. Um, it's a very important thing you, you just said because it, it I think it goes goes hand in hand uh, with uh, motivation and, and pride that the students should feel in class when they are learning. And um, practical tip tip that stems from what you've just said to all the teachers is that this is frustrating when you do that for the students uh, if they try to learn like like you said one all of the forms of one word, one, one verb or so on uh, within one class, virtually is impossible. They won't remember that, that's first of all. Secondly, there will be no pride. They, they won't be happy about what they just learned and said and so on. And this basically affects the motivation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, and it does, it really does affect the motivation. And sometimes you're talking, it's, it's almost like trying to teach them several words for one thing. Yeah, yeah. So it feels like a lot of memorization as well. Mm -hmm. And then and then what they do when they get to a conversation, when I've seen people do this, they get to a conversation and then they, they just get to the word and they're like, they're fearful of, okay, how does this end? Oh my word. Okay, pochong, 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 pochong. And they, 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 <laughs> they don't know which <laughs> one to choose. So they almost go through them all and and guess anyway. Mm -hmm. so just teach them as... Like in, in a in a set type of phrase, you use it with this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, learn it as a, a thing that you would say yeah. in, mm -hmm. in Polish or whatever other language. And you you know it, okay, that's how I say it. That's just mm -hmm. how it's used in that way. Or you learn it as by train or on the train. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's also a very practical thing to remember for, for the teachers that um, we will somehow, some way, sometime hear the other forms of this word, uh, yeah. either by somebody correcting us when we like, you know, make a mistake with it, yeah, or we hear it somewhere using a different form. Mm -hmm. And we realize, ah, okay, it's, it's probably the future because they're talking about tomorrow, yeah? So this yeah. is how it changes, yeah? So I, I totally, totally agree with you because uh, it's uh, trying to do the contrary and trying to pour over like one single word and all the different forms of it. 
basically, like, like I said before, it just kills the motivation. And that's something that we both agree is it's the most important thing uh, in language learning process. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes as well with, um, with, with vocabulary, when it gets to vocabulary particularly, there's so much to learn. Um, it can be tempting to sort of go down rabbit holes and sort of say, oh, and this is how you say this. And oh, this is how you say that. And sometimes the students are the ones that need to be led by the teacher, because sometimes the students will actually um, look for this. They think that they need to know all of these grammatical endings. They think that they need to know every single word that's related to colors all at once. And I think as a teacher, it's really important to say, OK, let's limit this to what we actually need for this lesson to use it. And then we will see other colors later. We will see other words for occupations or family members later. But for now, this is what we're learning so that we can talk about the very uh, sort of immediate circles. And if we go too far away, we've got too many of one type of word and we can't as you say, get that satisfaction of actually building a sentence that means something. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, now, talking about memory, um, which is, um, I think, hugely underestimated in, in the learning process. I don't know why, but it's like we, as teachers, we focus too much on teaching methods, on all of the things that we learn how and what to do uh, during um, the studies and, and um, by teachers' books or, or by course book that we use. Uh, we try, we become slaves to them too much, okay? And we, most of the teachers, we are not aware uh, of the power of memory as like, and what to do to increase it, to, to make it work for us. Uh, coming back to words, phrases, um, you said that you try to um, have them around you as much as possible and, and try to uh, meet them here and there whenever possible. How do you make it happen and what's important for you to shift those new words and new phrases, something into your long-term memory so that you can instantly use it when you need it? I think you... you probably when we come across new words and vocabulary, more times needed to actually spend pouring over um, what they are, where they've come from to make uh, connections in the brain. Mm -hmm. And it probably a good thing that I don't see used very often is asking the, the class, the students to think of things that they see related to these words. For example, they may have heard of a word that's similar or could be a word from their own language or another language or something that's famous that's related to it, that they say, do you know what? Yeah, actually, I've seen this word somewhere else. And if they tell a story, it might try, you know, start a memory for somebody else as well. And the more we talk about those kinds of activities and things, the more we can sort of build in a story that's easier for the brain to retain and process. The big issue, I think, is um, when we don't do that, and we just say, okay, we're just going to remember it. Well, okay, good luck, because you'll probably remember it for the test. It is a test, but will you remember it a week, a month, yeah. a year from yeah. now? Mm -hmm. Chances are you may not, because mm -hmm. it's not going to just magically stick in your head unless there's something really there, you're focusing on something. So some words will, of course, I mean, Sometimes you'll hear a word and it'll just be very simple and short, and it might be similar to the sounds and the words in another language you speak. But even when that happens, you're still using those kinds of stories and memory techniques, but in an unconscious way, because that's how your brain connects things, right? You, you, mm -hmm. you have to put things together. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they, they don't. They don't stick forever and ever. Sometimes the stories will fall away over time. But that's when the word is already in your locked in your long term memory, and mm -hmm. so you don't have to worry about it so much. Okay. I think that those kinds of things to do those with your, with with the class, for example, are quite useful. Um, so you know, movich razmuavac, like looking at why. That, that mm -hmm. verb in Polish, for example, mówić to speak, and then razmawać to to like chat, converse, 
um, why is it this? What's happening with that word? Well, you can see Movic still in Razmoavec because you've got the, the Movic, a variant of that. And then the Raz is a typical Slavic thing that kind of means like to chat about, around. And you see it in many things, like when things spread out or when things um, break. And so it's kind of breaks and splinters off. So you have this idea of like to chatter away, to converse. Yeah instead of just to speak, which is can be a, a, a unidirectional, monodirectional way of talking, right? So, mm-hmm. um, so these kinds of things to help people remember things they're going to see over and over again really, really help, um, I, I think, to, uh, you know, the word to converse, even in English, to converse, conversation, con, is you see it with lots of things because it means with. If you see con, you say with. So con it can also be seen as a co or a con like collaborate labor and you start seeing words and as a teacher you know which are the words they, they've seen right in class because mm-hmm. you've been teaching them so you, you know what kind of text they use so you can help to make these connections so that people see them mm-hmm. okay um putting together the uh, quite a few things you've said um if you were if you could, could give advice to teachers, um, because you've had lots of teachers in your life, uh, what are the things that you would uh, tell them to either avoid or do less in class because they are not, they don't seem to very, be very productive from the learner's point of view? Is there anything like that? Something they can do less of. I think rabbit holes is the worst thing. Mm-hmm. It, just, it tends to go down they go down rabbit holes so for example what i just mentioned now of um teaching how things are connected mm-hmm. stick to the things that they've actually seen don't start going into new vocabulary that's that's completely alien to them because that can be that that can be quite tempting uh-huh. to sort of start talking about things that they've never heard of right because they've got the same start or ending or the same core word it's it's really important to stick to things that actually are relatable for them so as a teacher you need to be very mindful of that i think um you're 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 explaining things that are useful and not things that are just completely random Mm -hmm. i've known teachers go through an entire lesson just going down that rabbit hole um or writing down every single word they think is important they're the rabbit holes that i would definitely avoid um less can sometimes be more when it comes to language Mm -hmm. so when people have have a feeling that they can use what they have to communicate something meaningful that's where they get that hurrah eureka moment that um you know i've I've actually achieved something so teaching them giving them tools sentences things to start conversations or ideas really helps so building block languages for example i think that this is nice good because they're building long sentences that give them that i've done it feeling Mm. without having to go down all the roads of grammar and everything else and this is where i think language is really that's where it works well and then you sort of start saying okay well you can say i think but then you can also say i believe uh in my opinion depending on what you're teaching you can obviously expand and contract that to what you need to say so for example if you're talking even in a basic lesson there's no there's no there's no reason why somebody can't give an opinion very very quickly in a language you know i think that friends is boring like the show on tv if you're talking Mm -hmm. about tv shows or films yeah i think that friends is funny depending on what they want to say you can give them like three three or three or so three or more options um, and building language in blocks like that means that they they know a formula, they can stick to it, they can substitute out the words and the phrases as necessary, and they know it will still work. And the more of those you can build out for the student, the more flexible their language becomes and the more they're going to be able to just use it to say exactly what they want to say. Okay, very interesting. I've been taking some notes so that I, I don't forget what I want to say, uh, just to... Again, I'd like to summarize what you've just said and put into some practical advice, some tips for, for language teachers. I think, I think a very important thing is to stick to limited um, language input, 
you want to use in class. And rather than um, stepping onto something that you have that follows in your course book, like, you know, oh, we finished that, so let's go to the next page. And your students like feel comfortable with that and everything. There is something that is uh, often called um, for the illusion of confidence where yeah. they've, they've got in front of them. So they feel like, oh yeah, we know it so we can carry on, yeah? So instead of doing that, going to the next lesson, um, following your advice and what I've read about, about cognitive, cognitive science and so on, the better thing to do is just to close the book and try to retrieve it as much as you can in lots of different versions from, from the students. And, and that retrieval is crucial for, for memory that we talked about, and it really helps. I'm, I'm glad you as a student feel this way because this is what helped me as a student uh, as well. Um, now, the other thing you mentioned uh, that we call a model language. So model language is what you said, like you, you put the structure of a sentence and you give options to choose from, yeah? Very often um, teachers ask me, to, so what do I do um, if um, I ask them a question and nobody says a word, yeah? Even though they're like intermediate or something, yeah? Or one or two students say something and the others, they are just um, silent. They won't say anything. And I said, you see, it's very simple. Give them a model language. Some of them will expand on it and some of them will feel proud that they've already used it. And then combining uh, retrieval with model language we can remove the parts of it step by step mm -hmm. of that model, yeah? And then come back to it and they will see themselves how much they remember and how difficult it is to remember those things. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Um, Richard, one more question about um, if you could um, go back to the moment when was the, you, you were learning the first foreign language and the way you did it, the things you need to learn it. Um, would you change anything now if you could turn back time and go to that moment uh, in, in um, you know, to make it faster, to make it more efficient, what would you change? <laughs> Invent the internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, in, in, all, in all honesty, um, it's very difficult to answer that because I started learning when I was about five so mm -hmm. I'm yeah um, that's, but it's that's, uh -huh. but I, I would say that the internet has been a game changer sort of mm -hmm. in terms of learning language because now we can create a world where the language is used in a natural way um, wherever we are so I can follow people on social media in any language I want to use or learn or improve or just have exposure to and I can basically incorporate that world into my world. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't so easy to do when I was younger. Um, so it's not something I could have done myself, but it's something people don't do still, and it's mm -hmm. available. And I think that that's probably why it's worth mentioning that follow people who teach or use the language that you're trying to learn on social media so that when you open your phone, you're confronted with the language all the time. So for example, at the moment this year, I've been trying to learn, try, I say trying to learn Korean. I'm not gonna go down the road of I've been learning Korean and I'm, I have been trying to learn Korean. It's, it's not, the, um, not been the easiest journey, I'll be honest. But what I do is on my uh, social media, I don't have to scroll very far until I come to Korean content on my Instagram, uh, on, on my uh, Twitter and I see it very, very quickly. So without making any effort, a language that otherwise is not in my direct field of vision where I live is on my phone whilst I'm waiting for something, whilst I'm uh, just checking messages or whatever else, it pops up. And that kind of thing I think is really useful because that helps to keep reinforcing it. Okay, lovely. Richard, thank you very much for this. Uh, it's been very informative and um, I've been trying and, and, and later on I'll try to write down some stuff that some more about how to translate everything you've said into um, the teaching techniques and anything we can do in classes in order to make it more um, efficient because I think, in my opinion, there are two amazing things 
very simple things that, that you can do to take your teaching to the next level. One of them is to just to become um, a student of a new language, start learning new language from scratch, even a few classes, like yeah. two, three classes, and you will be amazed. I'm talking to the teachers now, uh, how your perspective changes and what happens to your brain and how you feel about it and you will understand your students better. And the other thing would be to try and observe other teachers at work because when you have that fly on the wall perspective on everything and that you don't have when you're a teacher, you see things happening that, that, that you are normally not aware of. And I think that kind of like, I think there'll be a nice conclusion of everything we said here today about this teaching learning foreign language. Yeah. Richards, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. All, all the best to you in the future. Any, any plans for the near future to start learning a new language? Um, well, I'm carrying on with my uh, Celtic language study. So I'm uh, studying. Ooh, tough. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. Uh, so carrying on with that and also uh, finish or continuing with my Korean. Uh, slow burn, but we'll get there in the end. All right. Okay. Richard, thank you. Hope to see you soon. Yeah. See you soon. All Take the best. Care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.